My loves, you know, if you've been around for a minute with me, that I love to talk about suffering. Because when we talk about it, we lighten it up. We actually move closer to clear thinking, to happiness, lightening our load, joy, connection, all the things. No matter where you are at right now in the spectrum of happiness, health, challenge, arduous, wacky Wednesday, all the things, if you have ever bookmarked or saved a podcast episode of mine, this might be one you want to add to the list or start with because what I'm going to offer today about the dark night of the soul is applicable to the micro challenges and the big macro mega challenges. I'm going to weave in some beautiful perspective and poetry, or I should say poetic perspective from some of my favorite teachers. And then I promise, I promise, I promise we will end on hope. I also think it's really important to break down the characteristics of a true dark night of the soul, because this is a really misused term in the personal development consciousness space. I think a lot of things that aren't really an actual bona fide dark night get chalked up to that. And when we misperceive our challenges as the devastation, (laughs) the divine devastation that a dark night actually is, then we feel shocked when the dark night comes then we're just adding more drama and weight to just like the heavy, challenging things that come with divorce and health and elections and dysregulated nervous systems. And when we dramatize those things and say, oh, this is the darkest passage in my life, then they just become way heavier than they need to be. You know, sometimes our soul is just making us sweat a little more. We are running a little farther. We are not actually in the Iron Man phase of our life. So we don't need to freak out and lose it. We just need to meet the challenge. Dark Night of the Soul, however, is a totally different experience. Let's get into it. First, I need to introduce you to Manly P. Hall. If you are at all an esoterica metaphysical nerd, you probably have heard of Manly P. Hall. He's actually Canadian. I found out that he's from Peterborough, Ontario, which is not too far from where I was born. Uh, I came across him in my 20s with his classic book called The Secret Teaching of All Ages. (laughs) He covers all the bases. So... Manly P. Hall was really influential in the beginning of the metaphysical movement in the United States. Like before yoga was brought over from the East, before Kundalini, there was the early New Age. And he came out with the secret teachings of all ages. It challenged a lot of assumptions about spiritual roots. And who could I compare him to? He's really incomparable. He's like sort of the Wizard of Oz, but legit and grounded of the New Age before people in the West even called it the New Age. That's manly. Tall, skinny dude, white hair, white beard, white suit, throwing down. This is what he has to teach on the dark night of the soul. He says, The dark night of the soul is man's gradual discovery of his total dependence on the universal spirit which exists within him and around him. Mm. It is far more important to our ultimate good that we shall learn patience than that we shall escape from the causes of impatience. It is more important that we gain humility than that we gain dominion over the minds and attitudes of others. 
There is only one path that leads man out of misery, and that path is the practice of humility, patience, and faith. These simple attitudes constitute true education. The end of learning is not that we shall know everything, but that we shall be patient with everything. Not that we shall gain all things, but that we shall discover the vanity of that which is not true. Not that we shall be the masters of men, but that we choose to be servants of truth. And then he's going to bring us across the finish line. Man must learn to think with the eternal mind, to feel with the eternal heart, and to become one in the service of the eternal work. So let me just backtrack to the beginning of this gorgeous nugget from Manly P. Hall. The dark night of the soul is man's gradual discovery of his total dependence on the universal spirit which exists within him and around him. Let me just give you the Danielle truth bomb on that. Dark night of the soul is the recalibration of our priorities. Dark night of the soul is the recalibration of our priorities to love, to our true nature. Okay, so that's some manly for you. Before we get into some St. John of the Cross and Danielle wisdom, let me tell you the bigger things we've got going on, and then we'll just hold hands and glide through the rest of this conversation. My loves, when you are listening to this podcast, it is the perfect time to get your 2025 in order and get your soul on the agenda. If you want to have the heart-centered planner in your hands for the month of December, Christmas gifts, holidays, getting ready to write all your birthdays down and important dates in your beautiful planner, now is the time to order. Head to daniellelaporte.com slash planner. There's bundles, there's offers. It's more than just this gorgeous printed linen-bound weekly or daily edition. You are getting into the heart-centered membership experience. You come into our ecosystem, and I'm going to be sending you Sunday support emails forever and ever if that's how you want it. I'm not just dropping off this book on your doorstep. You're coming into this ecosystem of a heart-centered way of living. I've got you. Here's a gorgeous review of the planner from Robin McTagg of the Shift Network. If you felt overwhelmed by the conventional limiting models of goal setting, this planner might be just what you need. It invites you to break free of the exhausting cycle of burnout, merging intention with reflection, and transforming productivity into an act of love. Yeah, baby. I encourage you to move beyond mere checklists and explore how this planner can revamp your entire approach to life. She said it, so I don't have to. It's more than a planner. It's a way of being. 300,000 people took some of this methodology for a test drive. It's 10 years of my life. There was a three-year waiting list of 33,000 people. You get it? Go get it. So you head to daniellelaporte.com slash shop. And then at checkout, you put in this code and you'll get 10% off. Pod Planner 10. P-O-D Planner 10. Pod Planner 10 at checkout. And you get extra goodies. Oh my gosh. And I get to say something like, get your planners now for holiday delivery while supplies last. And legit, while supplies last. In my experience, my lived experience, and my research, I think we can boil it down to three keys for the dark night of the soul. Here we go. Number one, you question things you never questioned before. Now let me pull on some gospel of St. Thomas. If you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. I think what he's saying here is better out than in. I think what St. Thomas is really teaching is that when you bring forth your luminosity, when you start to wake up to your true nature, your divinity, your pure innocence, 
then your shadow will not take you down. And the soul is going to give us difficult, challenging, question everything kind of experiences so that we have to reach in deep and we reach in all directions to our higher self, our inner divinity, our innermost self, and to God and to the higher beings to really get to know the stuff that we're made of, the universal spirit which exists within us and around us, eternal mind, eternal heart. Second characteristic of a dark night of the soul is identity disillusion. So not only do you not know who you are or where you've been, (laughs) you have no idea who you are going to be when you get to the other side of it. You are complete soul soup. You know, this is where you bring the metaphor of metamorphosis, where the caterpillar gets completely liquefied. Like there is nothing in that soup of liquefaction that gives you any indication that the caterpillar is actually going to literally start growing a spine and antennae and wings and become a butterfly. Like there is nothing in the mess, in the muck, that portends to who you're going to be when you stand up straight again. And that is disarming and discombobulating. And I think that's where you really get into the dark. Let me bring in some St. John of the Cross for you. Okay, so you can't talk about Dark Night of the Soul without bringing in St. John of the Cross. He really coined this term, if you will. So he was a Spanish Catholic priest, and there were warring factions within Christianity. And St. John got captured, put in the clink. On a regular basis, he was whipped in public and was kept in solitude in a really small cell with no human contact. He questioned the reason for his existence. He questioned the existence of God, and he managed to escape eight months of torture, and he found his way out in a small window next to his cell. Now, in the darkest of the dark, he found the light of his true identity, his divine connection. And he wrote a poem called The Spiritual Canticle. Now, just like, you know, the Virgo in me is wondering, how did he actually write that poem? I mean, like they gave him salt and fish every day to eat. Did they actually give him a quill and some paper? Most of the time he was kept in the dark. Did he write it and memorize it? And then after his escape, he was able to write it down. I don't, I, I don't know. But what I do have for us today is some passages from a poem he wrote called Songs of the Soul. And so we're keeping in mind the intense devastation and agony that he is in, and he finds the light of life. So you're going to hear all that juxtaposition that Manly P. Hall is offering. You know, we learn patience, that we can escape from wanting to know about the causes of impatience. We're here to gain humility rather than being concerned about how we can power over other people. You can hear that kind of beautiful creative tension from St. John. Here we go. On a dark night, inflamed by love longing, oh, exquisite risk, undetected, I slipped away, my house at last, grown still, secure in the darkness. I climbed the secret ladder in disguise, oh, exquisite risk, concealed by the darkness, my house at last grown still, that sweet night, like a secret, nobody saw me, I did not see a thing, no other light, no other guide than the one burning in my heart. This light led the way, more clearly than the risen sun, to where he was waiting for me, the one I knew so intimately, in a place where no one could find us. O night that guided me, O night sweeter than sunrise, O night that joined lover with beloved, lover transformed into beloved, 
upon my blossoming breast, which I cultivated just for him. He drifted into sleep while I caressed him. A cedar breeze touched the air. Wind blew down from the tower, parting the locks of his hair. With his gentle hand, he wounded my neck, and all senses were suspended. I lost myself. I forgot myself. I lay my face against the beloved's face. Everything fell away, and I left myself behind, abandoning my cares among the lilies forgotten. This is the dissolution of identity, all my selves, the masks of my personalities, everything I've been so attached to, to feel that I would be worthy of the love of beloved, of God, of each other, all gets dissolved. And such a beautiful nod to the flower, lilies, so often a symbol of resurrection. In my resurrection amongst the lilies, my old identities are forgotten, and I'm okay with it. We lose ourself. Misperceptions of the small self, our wounded self, the restricted self, the beaten and abused self, the self on the outside of others, barred from belonging, All those illusions get laid down. They become compost. We forget the illusion of the small self, and we move into the truth of the higher self. It's a whole point. Which brings me to characteristic number three of Dark Night of the Soul, that we are pushed, sometimes we are dragged, we are pushed into presence. Time feels really tight. Time feels unfriendly. You know, this is the nature of feeling like you are in hell. It's not so much that you're in hell because you have what it takes to endure some burning. But what drives us crazy is wondering how long we're going to be in the hell. You know, is it like, do I just need to put up with this shit for another six weeks or another six years. Just, just, just tell me so that I can get my provisions together. And it's in that passage that you realize you just have to focus on today. The dark night of the soul has pushed you into being right here, right now, with the pain and the potential and the trauma, and the light, and the loneliness, and all of the resources, you're going to do one day at a time. Maybe you're going to do half a day at a time. That's how I did it. It's like, okay, I'm just going to get through the morning until lunch. Okay, I'm going to get through lunch now into the evening. And then I'm going to just surrender into the mercy of sleep after I put my kid to bed. Remember when I was in my tightest phase, talking to a friend who had been living with suicidal ideation since he was a little boy, just kept coming to him like seasons. And he said when he was at his worst, he would just get through 15 minute intervals. I'm just gonna get through the next 15 minutes without taking the next step towards killing myself. And as a result of that, he is now alive and well, more than 15 minutes at a time. You are baptized into the power of now and probably the power of prayer. I've got a short, beautiful prayer for you from Marabia Star. Uh, it's from a book called Mother of God, Similar to Fire. You might want to close your eyes right now. And if you need this prayer for yourself, you just speak it from your heart. You see those words coming out from that flowering heart chakra. And if you're not in this tight place right now, if you are far beyond, far away, far through and over that dark night, then maybe we pray this for all other beings in the darkness. Mother of Suffering, 
You carry the grief of the whole world in your boundless, shattered heart. Please, carry mine. I know that the broken open container of your mother's heart has room for us all. That's it. Mother of suffering. You carry the grief of the whole world in your boundless, shattered heart. Please carry mine. I know that the broken open container of your mother's heart has room for us all. Many mystics believe, as do I, that Mother Earth, Gaia, is going through her own dark night of the soul. And the beautiful thing about this is that the end of the story is inevitable. It's a continuum, but we always get to the other side. The light is always giving birth to more light. The mother has everything required to transmute, to transform, to rebirth, to just make miracles for breakfast. And given that each of us, every human, every sentient being is a cell in the body of the mother earth, then our duty is to walk the devoted path so that we get in alignment with our soul. We do all the things to bring forth our light, our loving kindness, our luminosity, our radiance, our common sense, our pure innocence, so that the darkness doesn't take us down. This is devotion training. Really, I think, I think we're in the Olympics of devotion. And anybody can choose to be devoted to anything. But this is the invite to be devoted to truth with a capital T. And truth is all for love. Every universal truth in all of its languages and expressions and embodiments leads back to the heart. So let's end with some hope. This is from me to you. Devotion to truth-seeking goes something like this. You're going to risk being disliked. Actually, it's not a risk. It's inevitable. At some point, you will be very misunderstood, and you won't know how much that stings until it happens. Devotion to truth means that you're going to take a hit for the team because you're not learning lessons just for your own good. Healing for one is healing for many. You will burn plans that you thought were the answer to your profound longing. You will pray on your knees with the flavor of begging in your throat. And you will ask for help. The vulnerable kind of asking when you're terrified that the answer could be no. You will humbly make amends. You will let people go. And you will build some walls because every kingdom has some walls. And there's a good chance that you will be profoundly lonely. It's by necessity, my love. It's by necessity that you will become your own lover because you will begin to feel it all in one day. And you will get up really early after staying up way too late in this dark night. And you will have learned to bend time. And you will subsist on your own confidence. You will put in your own money. You will do the hard work that integrity calls for. You will love it. After a while, you might even amaze yourself by not resenting it. Not resenting any of it. You are going to pass through the eye of a needle, stripped and shed and pared down to the pure pith of your power. And the few people who have seen you so naked, they will never speak of that beauty to anyone else. It's a private affair. You will transmute that emotional ripping pain into evolutionary leaps and bounds. You will find comfort in the rhythm that you are creating by being committed. 
you will come to adore the discipline of freely giving and freely receiving. You, my love, you will become a testament to the force of tenderness. And you will say thank you for all of it. And then you and all that devotion of yours, you will keep on going. With love, Danielle.